Hello, my name is Dustin Fuquay, and today I'm going to be telling you a story I like to call Picking Up the Pieces, Resource Documentation and Post-Disaster Recovery at the Bayou Folk Museum, Kate Chopin House. The context of this project is uh, Natchitoches Parish, Louisiana, and the, in particular the Cane River region. Um, note the historic maps uh, indicate a lot of landmarks that you'll see, different American Indian names and different French and actually colonial Spanish names as well. All the landmarks noted in these historic photos bear place names that reflect our French Creole and American Indian heritage. Natchitoches Parish is situated along the Red River in the northwestern part of Louisiana. Cane River, an oxbow of the Red River, and the surrounding Cane River National Heritage Area is home to numerous properties listed on the National Register of, His of Historic Places, seven National Historic Landmarks, and the Natchitoches National Historic Landmark District. So the area we're talking about today is, is rich in heritage. Um, I work for an organization of the an, an agency of uh, the National Park Service called Cane River Creole National Historical Park. The park is comprised of the Oakland Plantation and Magnolia Plantation units. Both of the plantation units were inhabited by the same founding families for over 200 years and maintain status as national bicentennial farms. The park maintains rapport with the descendants of the planters, overseers, enslaved tenants and sharecroppers, and the other traditionally associated people. The Bayou Folk Museum is a site within the Cane River National Heritage Area. The site, a National Historic Landmark, is comprised of the Alexis Clucci and Kate Chopin House, Dr. Worsley's office, a blacksmith shop, and cultural landscape features. Bayou Folk Museum was originally established by Mildred McCoy, a local heritage enthusiast, to serve as a museum devoted to the preservation of the local Cloutieville heritage. Ownership of the site was transferred to Northwestern State University of Louisiana for a short period in the 1980s, and finally to the Association for Preservation of Historic Natchitoches, whom also known, owns the well-known National Historic Landmark called Melrose Plantation. Though the primary structure and primary contributing future was originally constructed in 1806 by Alexis Cloutier, the founder of the town Cloutierville, the primary contributing feature of the site was also home to the famed writer Kate Chopin for at least eight years. Seizing on an era of resurgent interest in local folk life, APHN, the owners, decided to rename the property to the Kate Chopin House in the 1990s as part of a promotional trend. Yet, the structure maintains significance in its architecture and links to the Red River Campaign of the Civil War and other notable historic events. In homage to Kate Chopin and to the people of, that she called the Bayou Folk, I've included some Louisiana French Creole linguistics in this presentation. So note some of the linguistic representation you'll see on the slides. I was able to acquire funding by way of the Cane River National Heritage Area in a 2007 competitive grants program for the purposes of developing a heritage resource management plan. The Preserving Nostalgia Project enabled me to establish intellectual control of the museum collection as well as to document the heritage resources and site conditions therein. The Heritage Resources Management Plan included up-to-date resource documentation, a museum catalog, protocols for stewards, and a database for collections management. Special thanks to Cultural Lore, a comprehensive planning agency that directed this project. The Bayou Folk Museum site meant much more to the Cloutierville citizenry than just a house museum dedicated to a woman that only lived there eight years. The Bayou Folk Museum, with its contributing structures and cultural landscape features, was a community museum devoted to the preservation of shared Creole heritage. 
The former curator of the Bayou Folk Museum once told me that the Colucheville vicinity had been preserved by poverty. Though the area is still rich with an abundance of Creole architecture and vernacular historic structures, the character of the Colucheville vicinity has indeed changed much over the past 10 years. Structures including the Kate Chopin House and the Carnahan Store, a property listed on the National Register of Historic Places and photographed by the Historic American Building Survey, have both been lost to fire. Other structures such as these in the images were preserved by quote unquote passive neglect until recently. In fact, the home in the image was demolished in 2010. With regard to the final report document, uh, note the table of contents that's included on this image. Grant project work further involved developing a synthesis of existing documentation and research based on numerous local collections. Included in this slide are sketch maps and site plans that I developed to document the provenance of museum collections and archives at the Bayou Folk Museum. In some instances, I was able to build upon existing documentation by HABs and National Historic Landmark nominations. Field collections and digging revealed museum data compiled during the Mildred McCoy era that attributed many objects to specific donors and traditional cultural places including long lost plantations, legendary venues, and sites now nestled deep in the Kasachi National Forest. You'll note the image in the slide is actually uh, floor plans that were developed during the prior to the National Historic Landmark nomination process at the Bayou Folk Museum. Um, you'll note the three contributing structures are represented in the slides. There's the Bayou Folk Museum's Kate Chopin House. It's actually a two-story or two-floor structure. There is a doctor's office that attributed to Dr. Worsley, a female doctor in the early 20th century, and also a, a barn that was converted into a blacksmith shop for exhibit purposes. We'll talk a little bit more about the artifacts later in the presentation. With the mixed provenance of collections in mind, I chose to arrange the collections thematically. I made every effort to utilize existing documentation from the Mildred McCoy era and beyond, and was able to locate some management documentation. In some instances, I was able to reference the Bayou Folks Museum lost catalog numbers with new data to determine the provenience. I use the term lost catalog to refer to the Bayou Folk Museum's previous catalog um, as I understand, a project had occurred in the 1980s by which um, a local Northwestern State University student decided to perform a collections management project at Bayou Folk Museum, thereby cataloging all the objects that he could find. Well, this was in, you know, in the days of early technology where we had typewriter copies and only limited paper copies of documents, and lo and behold, both of the documents were lost. There were only two copies, as, as one of the stories I'm told, and they were both lost. So with that, we lost the catalog data that was pretty much already attributed to the, a lot of these objects. So in order to, to find out more about them, a lot of original research was also necessary. One component of the Bayou Folk Museum collections profiles component included baskets. In the images, you'll note uh, we have some baskets that are made by both American Indian and Creole or, or African American uh, traditionally associated people. The images on the left represent the American Indian baskets which are made of split river cane and uh, actually has split oak woven in it as well. So American Indian baskets we have river cane baskets. The plantation era baskets are more constructed of white oak. And then the image on the right depicts a, a basket that is something like a lot of the local scholars have never seen. It's, it, it's using exotic materials like non-native bamboo and other woods mixed together. So there were some really interesting baskets in this collection.
Regardless of the analysis of the baskets contributed to ongoing research conducted by NSU and Dr. Pete Gregory and Dr. Dana Lee. Interestingly, a number of local plantations maintain very similar basket collections. The topic of the plantation basket collections of Cane River may be referenced in Dr. Gregory and Dr. Lee's work called The Work of Tribal Hands by Northwestern State University Press. There's a chapter entitled Mystery Baskets of Cane River that I authored, concluded in this book. And uh, we mentioned the, the Bayou Folk Museum baskets as well as other examples from Cane River National Heritage Area sites. With the project, I was also able to identify and document several objects of cultural significance attributed to local Creole artists. In the image, you'll note a mortar that in French Creole we call a peel. Note the peels were recovered following the catastrophe at Bayou Folk Museum and are currently on exhibit at Melrose Plantation. Peels or mortars were used with a pilon or pestle to grind sassafras leaves for making gumbo filet. The tradition is still maintained by the Cane River Creole folklorist Oswald John Colson and other local traditional people. In developing the themed categories, I identified and documented several objects related to slavery. Note the vintage interpretive text document below the artifact reads, Slave Ankle Strap. This was plowed up many years ago off the Marco Plantation below Monet's Ferry. This plantation was named for Marco Geronovich, who migrated to the Cane River area from his native Austria. He was reputed to be one of the largest owners of slaves in the Cane River country. This is a handmade strap and has the original key which still operates the simple lock. So the image depicts a slave ankle strap or a, a, a slave shackle intended for the ankles of a, a human being. You'll note the documentation occurred before the fire, before the catastrophe, in which I cataloged the object. And lo and behold, artifact Trouvé, I was able to recover this artifact following the catastrophe. Also present in the Bayou Folk Museum collection was a number of grave markers reportedly recovered from nearby Shallow Lake Plantation. The markers were most probably constructed by enslaved African blacksmiths and mark the graves of the planter class as well as the Creole du Couleur. The markers were recovered and are currently on loan to the National Park Service at Cane River Creole National Historical Park. So these, the image depicts grave markers that were recovered from a, a local cemetery. The grave markers were made by enslaved blacksmiths. And most of them date to the, the middle 19th century. With regard to significance, one may ponder over the notion of why some things are worth preserving while others may not be. In some instances, I tend to base significance on material representations of things that no longer exist. As such, the images depict currency once used at plantation commissaries and lumber company stores in Natchitoches Parish. Very few of the structures represented by their respective plantation or lumber company currency exist today. These tokens represented in some cases entire towns, such as Montrose, Monet's Ferry, Chopin, and other local communities. So each of the, of the tokens, as, as they call it, or scrip, represent a different plantation store or a different lumber company store. Plantation agriculture was very pre prevalent in the Cane River region, but just to the west of us, in what is now the Kasachi National Forest, was a booming lumber operation in the late 19th and early 20th century. Most of the lumber company stores are long gone. Um, the communities, in some cases, still bear place names, like with the post offices. The post office may be named after the old community. 
but for the most part, all of the sites that are associated with these tokens are no longer here. And now, unfortunately, we don't even have the token representations of these sites. I keep alluding to a catastrophe. Well, on October 1st, 2008, at approximately 4 a.m., a fire began that raised the Kate Chopin house. The Cloutierville vicinity is primarily inhabited by the descendants of the Natchitoches colonial settlers. settlers. The homes along Louisiana Highway 495, many of which were constructed in the 19th century, are somewhat close to one another. The fire awoke many neighbors, including Teron Szilard, who captured the video footage of the devastating fire. The image represents a video file. Um, we actually have a video of after the fire started that one of the local citizens, in fact, the neighbor that lives across the street, was able to, to capture. So it's very rare in a disaster management situation that you have not only documentation of a heritage site prior to a catastrophe, but also during and after a catastrophe. I feel that the Bayou Folk Museum is, uh, I, I, I hesitate to say a good example, but I would say an example of a disaster management situation. The images in the slide tell it all. You can see that a structure once over two stories high with a, a bottom floor constructed of slave-made brick and an upper floor made of the earth and architecture bousillage was just reduced to rubble in, in a matter of hours. The only extant feature, one of the only extant features left after the fire was the chimney. You see the tall chimney stack stand there on the image on the left. The images depict some of the surviving architectural fabric on the front elevation of the Alexis Clucci home or the Kate Chopin house. You'll note the slave made low fired brick. So after any catastrophe, whether you have a plan in place or not, a steward must embark in a disaster management situation. So the, disaster, the umbrella of disaster management covers a lot of different things. A lot of times you're not planned for it and they just happen, but regardless, you have to manage the situation. So really in all catastrophes and all disasters, you're gonna conduct disaster management operations. One of the first goals I would suggest in a disaster management situation would be to first establish points of contact. Chances are that in a catastrophe such as a fire, the local law enforcement, local fire officers, uh, and other local security officers would, would probably be on site to, in fact, handle crowds of people, passers-by, and just to provide public safety. Um, so they would you know, more or less become in the hierarchy the, the primary point of contact, the on-site recovery personnel. But then you'll find that other roles must be established. So whereas a, an owner of an organization, in this case, the owner of the Bayou Folk Museum is an organization, um, an, or an organization of people that primarily live in the city of Natchitoches, about 25 miles away, and they're not actually able to get to the site as, you know, as fast as they would like to so they have to re rely on local people. So a lot of different roles will be established whether you want to establish them or not. The difficult process comes in coordinating the roles. So in a, a disaster like the Bayou Folk Museum losing the Kate Chopin house to fire, um, a lot of people actually showed up to support the disaster management efforts. Um, of course you had the law enforcement and the fire security folks and all the local interested people, but then you had people that just genuinely loved the site and that people that just were very sincere in their care for these objects. A lot of the local folks that donated collections to this site over the years came to help out in the, in the disaster after the fire. So, you know, you almost need to, to develop an incident command structure where you start establishing points of contact and all of these people that are coming to offer help, you really seize on the help. Rather than someone come and say, oh, I want to help, what can I do? 
and you don't know what you can have them to do, well, keep them handy and, and figure it out. A lot of times it'll be a traditional person that may be able to tell you about, in this instance, some of the artifacts, where that came from, and if an object was technically on loan or if it was a bona fide accessioned object in your collection. So these are all important things that we have to remember when we're coordinating roles. And of course, documentation is very key, you know, prior to, during, and after. Well, a lot of times we're quick to document our accomplishments and that we were able to preserve this and save this, but seldom do we find ourselves documenting our disappointments and our errors. It's important also to document some of these errors. That way we can learn, other folks can learn from, from what we've experienced. One of the next aspects of a disaster management situation would be salvage and recovery. If you, if you, in this instance, what can we save from this fire? Are there any significant artifacts that can be saved? Um, you know, what can we do to help preserve the heritage of, of this area? So though the, the zeal to save can be overwhelming, one should never disregard their own personal safety. I was overwhelmed by emotions and did not take the time to ensure my own safety, as can be noted in the images, in which I'm wearing no per personal protective equipment. I more or less heard of the fire, was nearby, and ran to the scene. Um, you know, this is just an image in which I'm depicted, but I would say do not do this. Don't try this at home, because no gloves. I mean, you, you could just have a case study on all the things wrong with me in these images. So you know, don't do this. Always take the time to get some personal protective equipment. In dealing with a disaster, more or less for the first time myself, especially with a site like this that I really cared a lot about and had a, a lot of a lot of you know love for, a lot of care for, I had spent a lot of time over there and really began to learn about the collection and learn, learn about the people. Well, when you have to deal with a disaster, you, you, after something like this, you just, you'll develop some unorthodox techniques, let's just say. So whereas you might have to have a certain kind of wheelbarrow to tow out, towed out a flaming hand-hewn timber, well, you might just rig something else to get that accomplished. So let's talk about one of these techniques and that I call the sense of smell. So fast forward a few weeks after the fire. Let's go to late October 2008. There were a few rainy days, and then there was an onset of contracted salvage and recovery services. A choice was made to salvage brick and timber materials to the furthest extent possible for preservation and adaptive reuse. Remember, this organization maintains another National Historic Landmark property called Melrose Plantation, and the timbers could theoretically be reused. The, the salvaged brick could also potentially be reused. Thousands of handmade bricks, likely made by enslaved workers, were salvaged brick by brick. Note the images on the bottom left depict a, a piece of equipment. The equipment was actually only used to, to pull out useless or otherwise uh, far too damaged objects like just burnt up timbers and that kind of thing. Otherwise everything was taken out more or less brick by brick and piece by piece. So in doing so, we noted that due to the manner of how certain features had fallen and deteriorated, some areas within the hull of the structure seemed to reveal intact views and strata. These contexts maintained pockets of preserved material, ingredients of melted bousillage, blended with powdery brick and masonry to bake a firm crust that in fact preserved the materials beneath. How could I be certain that the areas maintain the preserved materials, you may ask? Because I could smell them. Prior to the fire, prior to the catastrophe and prior to my project, uh, there was a curator that actually lived on site in a caretaker's cottage and she had pets and over the years after she left, prior to my project, the cats were around the place and you know, they, they pretty much lived around the Bayou Folk Museum and in fact inside the Kate Chopin house at times. So 
for a while, there was a lingering smell of, of the presence of cats around the structure. So when I say that I can find intact features based on smell, I mean that as I'm going down the rubble piles that you, you notice in the image on the bottom right, as you pull those bricks by brick and, and uh, covering by covering, you can smell actually like areas that were in fact saved by rubble piles falling on them. And these areas contain unburned materials. It's, it, it sounds crazy, I'm sure, but you would never think that the sense of smell could actually be used in a disaster recovery effort, but in fact it can. We had to adopt more unorthodox techniques in, in working at a site where the space was already limited and then with the disaster going on, you couldn't work anywhere near the rubble. Um, you had to just kind of find a place to work. So I think about the paper resources after the fire. Think about the fragility of paper. Then catch it on fire and douse it with water and mix it all around. Then think about the costs involved with preservation and perpetual care of damaged archives. Think about how much paper of various mediums, content, filled the old house. Salvaged paper was collected, dried, and containerized. Significant documents, including original edition of Kate Chopin's books, were managed using the freeze process. But for the most part, we literally had to lay plastic out and go through page by page and determine what was actually worth preserving because none of the paper documents were in good condition, let's say, that survived the fire. But what do you, you have to make some, some hard choices when you're out there and what do you cull and what do you keep? What you end up keeping can be a burden over the years and you know, what do you do with all this burnt pages? Why are we saving this? Can we just digitize this and get rid of it or whatever? But you have to make those kind of, those kind of decisions when you're responsible for a disaster management effort. While much of the structure's upper floors were burned, the architectural materials of the ground floor, constructed of handmade brick, preserved. Much of the heavy cypress timber structural components withstood the fire in situ atop the brick, creating a ghost frame of the upper stories. However, in an effort to salvage the historic timbers, an individual was allowed to utilize a backhoe to remove the usable materials. In doing so, the operator used the backhoe to essentially scrape away the burning materials away from the brick frame. According to the state fire marshal, the use of heavy equipment resulted in destruction of any evidence that may have caused the fire. Therefore, it was in thinking in, in terms of the organization's mindset, yeah, let's salvage what we can. And you have someone come to you and offer you a piece of equipment and say that they can get the timbers out and no problem. And it sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. But that can trigger chain reactions of other things. So going inside of that ruin pile, Actually, it took away any kind of evidence that we could have said whether this fire was in fact accidental, electrical, an arson, or what. So because of that, we really have no evidence you know, to say what caused the fire. I mentioned the writer Kate Chopin that once lived at the Alexis Clucci house. Um, she was an author of a folk life scholar, if you would, and she wrote a lot about the local community and a lot about Louisiana heritage. And she actually used a lot of the Louisiana French language in her writings. So I thought it, it would be a fitting phrase to use the French Creole term, n'oubliez pas, or don't forget. So we're flashing forward now several years after the fire. It's been a, about five years. And when you go out there today, the site more or less looks like the images depicted in the, in the slide. Um, there are a handful of standing features still left from the bottom floor. There's some brick that's still standing. There are cisterns, the, the tops of cisterns. You'll notice on the image on the top right. So when I think about other sites and, and what people have done with you know, preserving a site after a fire, some things are possible. I, I've seen where some sites have ghost frames of some of the architectural tim timbers to resemble what the facade used to look like or these kind of things. But I would just ask uh, the community and the, and the organization to nubliae pa, don't forget. The site still 
is actually still listed as a National Historic Landmark. It still retains its NHL status. And although the pr primary contributing structure is reduced to a ruin, the site still maintains an original doctor's office and a repurposed blacksmith shop, as well as a substantial museum collection. In fact, as part of a disaster management workshop that uh, I'm working with with the National Center, we're going to be having a workshop uh, to discuss disaster management techniques on site at the Bayou Folk Museum in the coming month. So there's some more information available at the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training's website. Back to talking about our site uh, and, and what do we do with the site. There are a lot of questions that we want to ask. So just there's a few things that we don't want to forget in the meantime. Anytime you have a situation where you're a steward of a heritage site, you just got to keep in mind that different people have different levels of significance that they place on things. And in this case, the local community was very hurt by the loss of this place. So you have to be able to ask yourself, did I do enough beforehand? Did I have to do enough during? Did I do enough after? So you know, think about that w with your site that's still, that's still there and ask yourself you know, these kind of questions. Always remember to document to nauseating detail. It may seem rel relentless that you are cataloging all these horseshoes or all of these uh, ceramic sherds or, or these historic nails or whatever, and it, it seems relentless and pointless. But that documentation will, will help you out afterwards if, if something does happen. Um, it's always important to have backup copies of catalog data. It's always important to have off-site storage of certain significant things when you have a vulnerability. Always remember that photos are priceless. Um, sometimes I tell myself I need to limit myself in the number of photos that I take and that one or two quality, high quality photos are a lot better than 10 medium quality photos. But when, you, when it really comes down to it, the more photos you have, the better. The more photographic documentation that you have, the more architectural documentation you have in, in the data in terms of dimensions, uh, et cetera, that, that's priceless. You can never replicate that. So just keep that in mind. And then when you're doing a, a disaster project, you know, just remember to think things through. You start doing things, and you know, it's going to cause other things to happen. You have to communicate effectively. You have to work with all these different people that we talked about. Folks are just going to come to help. Um, put them to work. Have them doing something that's, that's worthwhile. And then prior to a catastrophe, you know, just in your, in your management of your site, you, you really should have an emergency operations plan in place. If you're with the National Park Service, you're actually somewhat mandated to have an, an emergency operations plan. For instance, the park that I work for, Cane River Creole National Historical Park, we have an emergency operations plan. Um, these kind of plans should include, of course, things about personal safety, about the safety of any visitors or any staff people you're working with. They should usually include a contingency of operations plan. Let's say, like, if we don't have a place to come back to work, where, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? That's the kind of stuff you got to think about and you, you, you ought to put in one of these plans. And then you should really outline how the salvage and recovery efforts are going to take place because there's going to be some, some things that you're going to have to do. If a site is unsafe, you may have to you know, limit access. You may have to build a perimeter fence. You may have to hire security, these kind of things. So it, a lot goes into it, and we kind of we take it for granted, but it, it's always good to be emergency-minded. So what will happen to the site? What's going to happen to the Bayou Folk Museum? I know in the meanwhile, um, organizations like the National Park Service are going to be working with the owners to um, salvage what is there to help with any kind of management that they want to do on site. Um, you know, just we're here to help in terms of technical assistance or lending a hand or whatever else we're going to do. But in terms of the long-term goal of what the organization is going to do with the site, I really could not tell you. Um, it, it's, it's been an issue that it's, a, it's, part of, it's, it's the organization's issue to deal with, and we're here to help. We're not here to guide. We're not here to manage. We're only here to help. So otherwise, the site looks much the same as it did with the images I showed. It's, it's still in ruins. The site does have a lot of uh, potential, and I just ask that the organization, nobly a pas, don't forget. 
few folks I'd like to acknowledge in the project. Uh, Cultural Lore was the consulting agency that performed the work at the site. The Cane River National Heritage Area provided a grant to perform the, the pre-disaster project, the documentation. The National Park Service, after the catastrophe, uh, provided resources, uh, big stake body trucks, storage, technical assistance, all these kind of things. Also, there was a lot of help from the local Northwestern State University's Heritage Resources Program. There's actually a graduate program that was even doing work at the site on the project with me before the disaster. So while there's students, you know, at the same time, they actually worked on the, on the disaster part as well. The National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, uh, big thanks to Sean Clifford and Jeff Ewan. They were on site when the disaster was going on, and they're the credit for a lot of the great imagery you saw during the fire. The Natchitoches Parish Volunteer Fire Department, District 1 and, and other local volunteer firefighters. Uh, the people that responded to the site, it was, it, was very, it was a quick response. A lot of people were mobilized. A lot of people you know, put in a lot of good work and a lot of help. And the same was the case with the Natchitoches Parish Sheriff's Office. They had to make the call on, on to pull the chimney down. You, you notice the standing chimney in one of those slide images. Um, you know, you kind of want to preserve something like that, but when it becomes a public safety issue, you have to go with what the law enforcement says. So we, we really appreciate the guidance of uh, Deputy Roger at NPSO. And also, you know, great thanks, of course, to the owners of the site. They allowed me to, to work on a documentation project by way of the Cane River National Heritage Area Grant. Um, and I was there for them afterwards after the fire and continue to be there for them, as well as the National Park Service and, and our partners. So thank you for your attention, and feel free to contact me with any questions. My contact information is listed in the slide in front of you. Have a good day.